Well, welcome everybody. Today we have Christine with us, who's a stylist, an industry speaker, a trainer, a leadership expert. It's, it's just incredible all that she's done since she started her career in 1990. Yes, I'll say that because you don't look like that's how long you've been in this industry. Um, you're a John Maxwell coach and you've taken his leadership and you've, you've offered workshops, seminars, mastermind groups, lots of coaching. Um, and in 2000, you created your own salon. So kind of talk about the journey that you've, you've had for such a long time. Yeah, well, I started my career, but also soon. And um, I, I, um, I don't know, I guess I became very excited about the technical part of our industry, right? Um, so the whole mastery of this craft and to then pass everything that Vidal did in his lifetime with our industry to be able to pass that on and to keep that sort of legend alive was always my goal. Like, how can we create more amazing hairdressers and people that are really passionate about what they do? And so um, I, I originally actually wanted to open an academy. And when I left Vidal, I started becoming an independent educator. And so I would travel around to salons and teach. And that was my goal to really open an academy. And I, I was in a town, Red Bank in New Jersey, and um, I even went into the salon and I said, I, I would love to work here, but I'm going to tell you, I'm going to leave in one year. So I, I just going to tell you that I don't want to take anything from your business. I will actually train all of your employees and help your business while I'm here, but I'm just going to be here for one year. And my plan was to then find a space to do an academy. And I ended up finding a, um, a salon that went out of business. At that time, imagine the rent was, I think, $1,200. It was as much as my apartment at that time. And I was like, okay, perfect. <laughs> this is great. I put in a couple new sinks and, and painted the place and with a, a, an investment of less than $10,000. And I was on my way. And so then I just started training people out of cosmetology school one by one. And that's really how it started. And so my love for training has not died. And I just continue to do that. And that's, I think, what brought me to the John Maxwell team. So amazing. And I love uh, being involved with you in a coaching company that we have together as well, too, Christine, with Empowered Salon Leaders, which I think is amazing. And, and something that, that just popped up actually really recently, and I'd love to hear how you would respond to this. I had a graduate that I've been coaching, and he said, well, I don't really want to work for anybody because they're going to take 50% of what I earn. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> how would you respond to that? <laughs> and coach salon owners out there, how they should respond to that as yeah, well. Yeah, I, I think that's, well, I think it's interesting. And I, I, you know, I think some people are just meant to be entrepreneurs. Let's just put that out there. So yeah. he may be one of those people that is just really meant to be a leader and an entrepreneur. So I won't take that away because you never know. Um, however, um, I would just really educate someone on the, the business side, because I didn't know this when I first started, you know, I went in, I opened my salon as a technical hairdresser. I was very good at the craft of what I did. And I really didn't even think about the business side. I quickly learned because just like this gentleman, the question started coming up about how do I get paid? When do I get paid? How much can I get paid? And all of a sudden I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> wait a minute. I'm not prepared for any of this. So I would say to salon owners, um, first, first and foremost is get prepared. Know your numbers and know what you're capable of paying. Um, 50% is, is too much. We have too many expenses. Uh -huh. And um, I think that we have to educate the stylists, especially on the cost of, of what it costs our businesses to run per hour, 
so that they know what the critical numbers are and what the profit margin is really. Yeah. You brought up you brought up a really good point that 50% is is too much. So so talk to that salon owner that's listening and saying, shoot, I already pay 50%, 52%, 55%. I mean, we've talked to some that pay 60%. How how do what advice would you give for them to almost backtrack or should they not backtrack? Well, that's an interesting question. And um, I've never been commissioned. Uh, I was always team-based. I just started to be on a commission only this year. So I was team-based for over 20 years in my business. So um, I had a very um, calculated payroll always. I was always had a very controlled payroll and it never exceeded 42%. Um, and so that is what I always kept my business business at. My profit margins were always with owner's pay. So not excluding owner's pay, but with owner's pay, they were 15% to 20%. So with owner's pay, they were 30% profit. So, and that was for 20 something years and the same now. So I think my, um, how do you backtrack? One of the things that I have learned is not to do too much change to old people. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, and Van, Van Michaels actually taught me this. He said, keep the old and change the new. And the one thing I could say is I'm very involved in training. And I think that when you have someone, you have to look at their credentials. So if you're paying somebody 50%, what can they bring to the salon that gives you that 10% extra? So Maybe they're not just getting paid as a stylist and bringing revenue behind the chair. Maybe part of that 10% extra, they get paid for teaching. They get paid for inspiring. They get paid for, so I wouldn't just look at it as 50%. I would actually look at the performance that makes up that 50%. And I would back into what are they doing now? It's a whole nother conversation. If that person is making 50% and they're doing very little, then that's a different type of conversation. So for me, I would look at performance first and then think about what it is that they contribute. Because many times what happens is we take things away and that person may be inspiring. Maybe they're actually training the new talents. And so if we take them out of the picture altogether, then what happens? Then everything just kind of falls apart and crumbles because then the owner is going to have to step in and do all the inspiration. So I would really look at this as a whole picture. I don't think it's just a black and white answer. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that. I love that. Talk so much. Um, yeah, so I, I think the biggest thing that I, I would love for you to share because I think salon owners desperately need to get a coach and maybe two or three different coaches in their back pocket because you can't just like all of a sudden just figure this out on your own and we see all these different platforms where the salon owners are asking all these questions that they should be asking a coach or a coach or two or three and not on a Facebook post you know how should I run my business you know let's start over here so can you talk a little bit about the importance of a coach on, on your perspective Oh, absolutely. And I would say more than one. I mean, I, in my time, I've had at one time, I've had a marketing coach, a, a communication coach, and a thinking partner coach. So, so for me, it's not even having always one coach. It's what does that one coach do really well? And how can they contribute to my business? And do I need someone else that can contribute in another way? So, and then I would still even look outside that box and say, okay, what, what are my needs? Like for me, my need when I first opened the salon was I need to understand numbers. I need to understand how my business operates. So how do I build a cash flow? What's a PL? 
Um, what are statement of cash flows? You know, how do I look at them? You know, how am I how am I analyzing my business? What are the percentages of payroll? What are the percentages of you know taxes? What are the percentages of rent? Just to understand where I should be benchmarking. So for me, that was important. Then when I went through John Maxwell, it was like, how do I lead and how do I scale? How do I really become a better leader so that I can make room for other people in my company? Um, I hired one of my coaches, actually, Tina, that you met, Jamie. She's no longer with us anymore. She uh, passed away a couple of years ago, but she was one of, she was one of those coaches I had for 20 years. And she was, she was, she was, um, a fierce conversation coach. So she understood how to communicate really well. I always had her in my back pocket because boy, do we need communication in our companies as leaders, as stylists, as managers. And I think uh, she really taught me how to have fierce conversations in a way that is all inclusive in a way that makes people feel valued. Uh, so, um, you know, that whole versus coaching, telling versus coaching, or, you know, that process, understanding how to, how to receive feedback, understanding. I used to have, hire her to come to every single staff meeting and then tell me afterwards, how did I do? And in the beginning, guess what? It wasn't so good. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> you you know, we talk a lot about communication in, in Next Level because that is one of the keys to the foundational success of, of any business. And one of the things I love that you brought up was you were open to feedback in order to give feedback. So talk a little bit about what that journey was like for you because you were so open to it because a lot of... Um, People that are in leadership roles sometimes are open to that and they fall into the mentality of it's my way, just do what, what I say and do it now. Mm. Well, the one thing I will say is um, when I noticed, I, I might not have been super open in the beginning, um, but I thought I was. So I had very little awareness, self-awareness. Okay, so I think that's the first uh, the first challenge is we don't know what we don't know. So um, I think that it's important to ask the people that are around you what they see. So I would always ask my coach, can you give me feedback on what I need to know that I don't know? Like, because if you can imagine, I always look at sports people and, you know, if you're a Tiger Woods and you're shooting you know, a golf ball and you want that coach to tell you every single move and how you're holding your body position so you could make that one degree shift, right? I was the same way when I mastered my craft. It was the same way. I, I asked my, my teacher, can you help me because I need to learn how to ha have my body position so I could do that perfect haircut. Well, when we're, when we're a leader, we need someone else to teach us to move our positioning one degree, two degree, three degrees. And we it's very important that we understand we can't see ourselves. So what's going to happen? And it's what happened to me is people are going to quit you. People are going to say negative things about you. People are going to, you know, your team is going to tell you stuff and you're going to get defensive. Well, when you notice that you get defensive, like now when I get defensive, I'm very aware. And I say, okay, what's triggering you? What's, and I will ask myself these questions. So, so what is, what is making your blood boil right now? Because it's nothing to do with that person. It's obviously it's a trigger for maybe something past that has happened. So there's, this is a very complex I think, um, conversation because communication goes so deep. And a lot of times it is based on past trauma. It could be childhood. It could be 
you know, how were we raised? Were we allowed to communicate when we were younger or were we hushed? And were we told that the adult is the right way and that is it, if they say it. And so I believe that this is something that has to be nurtured and it really has to be understood that this is a place of um, a place where we make mistakes, where, where it's messy. And we have to be allowed to communicate sometimes the wrong way in order for us to know the right way. And so I think when we're dealing with not only us as leaders, but if we're going to make a mess as leaders, we have to allow our employees to do that too. Like this is, this is about, you know, learning as we go, we're all learning. And so that's really what has come up for me, especially in communication. Yeah, feedback is, is everything, but it's also, it's a process to build safety to get that feedback. So alluding to Sean's question, you know, um, I think one of the biggest things, and, and I would love to, for you to share this too, because I know you've experienced it as well. And I love the fact that you've had a coach listen on your meetings. I think every leader needs to do that because that way you can, you know, see like, wow, what are my blind spots that I'm not even seeing myself, you know, or even recording it and letting your coach watch it, you know, from that point, if, if you do it via Zoom, because most of our staff meetings are via Zoom now because of having several locations. Once you scale it, it's a whole nother story, right? Yeah, and so yeah. I think one of the questions that I asked, and I would love to kind of hear your uh, thoughts on this, Christine, is how, how have you built safety? And one of the things that I know whether or not someone feels safe with me is I'll ask them, you know, what is it like to sit on the other side of the table of me and see if they're really honest? you know, well, to be honest, <laughs> you know, this is what I see. Um, so that's one of the things that I've done to build safety. Um, but the other thing is to be self-effacing of actually sharing all of the things that I need to work on so that they know that I actually know those things as well. And, but then also like really working hard to grow past those too. So not just saying, oh, I'm so bad at this, but not growing at all. Now that's a whole nother story, right? So how have you built that safety with your team? And also how do you work on not only your performance goals, but your growth goals through that process? So the, the first question I would say this, that trust for me is built, um, I guess you could say one conversation at a time. I don't think it could be built quickly always. And I think you have a different trust level with each employee. And I don't think it's just, you know, your whole team is on board at the same time. Um, and it's going to change at different times. So um, if you don't follow through on something, your trust level is going to go down. If you're, you know, so it's just really depends on, you know, timing. It depends on your performance as a leader. And I think that we just talked about feedback. I think that asking for feedback about how you're doing as a leader builds trust and it allows you to see your blind spots. So for me, that's how I would uh, say I build it. And then the other part of that would be I allow my employees to have a voice. So I always use what's called the beach ball conversation and most of the things that we want to do. And so what that means is if you imagine a beach ball, one side's, you know, blue, red, yellow, green, mm -hmm. and everyone on the team is standing on one side of that ball. And so if you bring an issue up that's, that's happening in the salon you, and you want to get everyone's buy-in, it doesn't mean that you're going to listen to what every single person is saying, but you're going to be able to make a better decision for the company when you hear every single person on the team. And so for me, I always tell everyone, I can't make a decision based on the benefit of one person. I have to make a decision based on the benefit of the whole company. And, you know, are we profitable by making this decision? Is this going to hurt us financially? Is it going to, you know, hurt morale? Like I have to think about all these things before I make those decisions. So I would say from a trust level, when I am all inclusive and I allow people to have a voice, 
then I believe that I build that trust and safety. And when, when that gets broken and you're blindsided, like, like you said, and you know, people quit, Mm -hmm. how, how have you handled people quitting? Because we've, you know, we've talked about, um, what the challenge is right now, trying to maintain quality staff, recruit quality staff. So the last thing you want to do is, is have someone that leaves, but when you're blindsided and it happens, how have you dealt with that in the past? Well, I'll take this from my mindset shift because I think when I first entered owning a salon, I was very giving. I came from a culture. I came from Vidal Sassoon, which was you, you, you just lift and give to everyone. Mm-hmm. And what happened was, and I think this happens to a lot of salon owners, people leave and they become bitter, angry, and they start to not trust. And it happened to me, but I never thought it would happen to me because I was always that person. And I was thinking to myself, I didn't like the person that I became. I didn't want to be fearful. I didn't want to worry about whether people were leaving because it actually then I attracted, I felt like I attracted more of that. And, and I, so the answer to your question is I didn't handle it well after time because I felt that I became the person I didn't want to become. And when I started to work on myself and not focus on other people, that's when the shift happened. And so I was worried and always thinking about what do they have to do better? What do they, and when I took the, took the focus off of them and I started to really focus on me and believe it or not, my first, my first stop was therapy. I remember going into the therapy and I'm saying to myself, well, I'm getting a very similar um, relationship in all these avenues of my life and my personal relationships and my business relationships. There's got to be a common thread. And, you know, I need feedback. (laughs) I need you to help because something's not right. Well, we did a lot of work together was it almost the same year that I joined the John Maxwell team? And um, I, my favorite quote, you must go within or you will go without. And I remember seeing that and saying, Ooh, boy, isn't this true? So I went deep down into my own self and I really started to reflect on what did I do differently when I first opened? What was my attitude? Who was I? Because I don't like this part, but I loved when I first started. So what did I have then that I don't have now? And what I had was trust and confidence in myself. Mm -hmm. And I lost that because as people left, Mm -hmm. I felt less confident and I felt more insecure. And when you make decisions as an insecure leader versus a secure leader, and you make decisions out of fear versus faith, usually it doesn't go so well. So that was, so now I would say I handle it way better. Um, I am understanding that no one is staying forever, Mm -hmm. but I sure as hell am gonna try to make their stay the best stay that I could make it. Yeah, that's, this is so big. And I think we could spend hours on this because this is everything. I think that people are starting to see the fruition of this, of, you know, people quitting easily and, you know, leaving because it's all over social media. You know, if you're not happy, just quit. You know, if you don't feel like you have work-life balance, just quit, just be done. Right. And so I love what you're saying because this is huge. And I think part of it has to be us as leaders training our staff how to quit. I realize that you're not going to be with us forever, but can I show you how to leave this place better than you found it? 
you know, can I show you what would be really awesome for you to do in our companies in order to quit? And so I, I think no matter what business you're in, right? And so talk about that because I think that's kind of an area, Christine, that no one is doing, including us. Like we we kind of have a little bit of training in this area, but we're not, we haven't systemized it of what that might look like. It's been hard to have those conversations. You know, it's like, how do I dialogue this right now? You know, how to quit. And so I started it at one time and it kind of trickled down through our companies and then it didn't happen, you know, but but because of the fact that I think, um, just to kind of share with you, like that'll carry with you through the rest of your life if you quit wrong a company. I remember quitting wrong in a company that I worked for. It was in dentistry back in my day. And I remember quitting wrong and it actually stayed with me in my mind, the back of my mind for years. And I felt like really sad and I, I was a really hard time for me to forgive myself through that process. And so I was like, wow, I need to train people on this and let them know how I quit with this company and how I spoke badly of my leader and how I gossiped about him and, and all this crazy stuff. Right. And so can you talk about that, Christine? Because I think that's an unsaid area that I think could be the possible answer to all of this. <laughs> well, there's a couple things. One, I think when you have to be honest, first of all, like I, when I went into that salon and I knew I was going to either open a salon or open an academy and it was going to be in the same town, it was going to be down the street. I just went in and said, listen, this is what I'm going to do. Um, you know, are you okay with that? And I remember I went to Christopher Pluck, who used to work at Vidal and he said, no, I'm not okay with it. And I said, okay, next or, you know, are you okay with it? Yes, we're okay with it. I said, I'll, I'll give you, a, we'll do a reciprocal agreement. I'll train your team while you let me do this. I won't take one client from you. I'll build all my own clients and then I'll leave. Is that okay with you? Yeah, that's okay with us. Okay, great. So I think that if you're going to be the person that's going to be so confident that you can go down the street and open up the salon, you should be so confident as to let them know what, what it is that you're doing. So I think from a stylist perspective, like it, it's got to be OK. And if you're a salon owner that says, well, listen, I think that's great because you have talent. You mm -hmm. can help me in a short time. I think we have to be a, be a little bit open minded here that. You know, what is this person going to be able to do for me in this time period? Mm -hmm. um, and what are their talents? How can they contribute to my business? I mean, if, if I were to turn around and look at me coming into my business now and saying, wow, this person is going to be with us for one year and they can help us train our team to that level. Right. If I would be silly to even think otherwise right? Because they can contribute so much. It's actually priceless because you could pay to go to one class for somebody like that for $1,500 to $2,000 for one day, and you have them for an entire year in your organization. So let's think about that. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would say definitely, you know, we really just have to be a little bit more open-minded and flexible, I guess is the word. That's the word I wrote down. And the other thing that came to mind as you were talking, Tina, was what if we did stay interviews instead of exit interviews? So what if we had before our, we even, we know that there could be a possibility. What if we did stay interviews with our staff and we said, what would make you leave? Yeah, that's hmm. good. What wow. would make you want to stay here longer? So I'm, and I'm going to give you an example that just happened in my company and I'm very aware of it. And I'm thinking to myself, how could I be flexible? And I would never have done this years ago, but I do know the market and I know the shifts that are happening out there. And flexibility is a very big thing for people. And it, and so I do get that. And it's top on the list. People want flexibility. And so a year ago, I haven't been in the salon in a year because of my health. And a year ago, 
I had hired someone with experience, very talented girl, and um, she's a mom, and her her husband has a a, a job where he works nights. So um, they have two young children, and one of the things that she had said is, "I really want a flexible schedule." So I hadn't been working with her. Um, that often uh, going into the salon that often, but I did know and understand that she wanted a flexible schedule. But to me, flexible is different than what it was to her, right? right? And so we had to get really clear on what is the word flexible mean? Mm -hmm. And I bring this up because sometimes the meaning of words are different for different people. And so what is flexible to you? And so flexible to her was, well, I want to be able to, if I need to come in late that day, I'm able to just come in late. And if I want to leave early, then I'm able to just leave early. And I said, okay, that's not flexible to me, right? But I understand the flexible to you. And so now this is really important. So what did I do? I had a beach ball conversation with the entire company mm -hmm. and, and the, the beach ball was on flexibility. And it was, how does it affect the whole team when we have schedules that people just come and go? And so mm -hmm. rather than me, and this is where I think it's really important. Um, and it goes back to what keeps people and what makes people fly is when people don't realize that they have a voice, that they could they can help to change. It doesn't mean the, the culture is gonna be changed for the worse. The culture may be changed for the better. Mm -hmm. The culture, it, they may bring up an idea that I'm not even aware of that could possibly work better than I ever anticipated. And so I think that I agree with that. I definitely agree with the exit interview is interviewing somebody after they leave, but I've been really working on stay interviews so that I can really find what is it. And for this person, it would be that if she doesn't, if she can't get some flexibility, and I think that's for probably more than 50% of my team, if they need some kind of flexibility, um, then it would be hard for them. So I would encourage people to have those types of conversations. Yeah, that's big, that's brilliant. I wanna circle back as we kind of come towards come towards a close is you mentioned 15% um, profit with owner's pay because you you utilize team-based pay. Mm -hmm. For the owners that are, are listening today that are unfamiliar with it, maybe never heard of it, but you sparked some interest when you heard that the owners are getting paid and the salon's still making money. So talk a little bit, a quick overview of team-based pay. Okay. So I'm not a master at this. Neil Dukoff would be the master. <laughs> However, um, it, it is a, um, a model that really helps to work together. So you, you're paid on performance and you're paid hourly and there's a broadband and what happens is at each level, you go up in the broadband based on your key indi indicators and performance. So it's directly tied into your performance. And the benchmarks are, we really, they really strive for you to get at least 15% bottom line profit. So now you get paid as an owner. So it's not that you look at the bottom and you say, okay, what's left over for me? It is you're built into that cash flow. So you as an owner and, and or leader, your 10% profit. I mean, your 10% uh, of pay, right? For, for an owner. Now, if there's an owner and a manager, then maybe you're five and five, or maybe you're six and four. So, you know, you really have to kind of take a look at that. and you know, you have to get sometimes a bit creative with the, with the numbers, but, um, and then it's also encouraged to do profit sharing so that as people are moving up and people are starting to get more involved with the company that they have a, a stake in the outcome. So the more that they're really contributing to the company, 
they're yeah. able to make a profit, a piece. Maybe it's, you know, 0.5 or 1% of profit. So it gives them, you know, the ability to have a, a, a stake in the, in the outcome, you know, in the bigger picture. Yeah. I know a lot of companies love doing that, um, you know, that, that way of pay, which is, I think is awesome. Uh, the, one, so the one thing, Tina, that I, I will say what I loved about that was that it's very predictable, right? You knew every single month what your payroll was going to be. And so that was really the beauty of that. So you didn't have to, you know, there wasn't sleepless nights or, you know, you really, really understood exactly where you were every single month. Yeah, that makes sense. I love that. And I think uh, one of the things too is, but it's not predictable how much they're going to bring in. So you have to drive the performance. And so I think that's why most salons are thinking, ah, I'd rather just do commission because it's based on what they can actually bring in the door. And it's a more safe way of, of paying. And so I think that's probably why majority of salons go that route, you know, versus the team-based pay. But I think once you educate yourself, you can determine for your market and for you and your leaders, you know, what would work out best for your business model, but pick a model, <laughs> pick, a, pick a model with integrity, I think is the most important thing. And, and one thing I really love about you, Christine, and this is why I'm partnered with you in the Empowered Salon Leader Group, is just you're super integral in your business practices. And can you talk about uh, some of the programs that you're offering and how people can get a hold of you? Because you've been doing some tremendous things for the industry industry as of late. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I love partnering with you too, <laughs> Tina. I learned so much. Um, so right now I have two programs. Uh, one that is actually closing. Um, we closed to the public launch, uh, but we're still, we still have a couple of people that are onboarding. So if anyone's interested in that, it actually will be closed September 12th will be the start date. So, um, and that particular program is to build your training program in 90 days. And so we start off with a salon owner's vision of what do they want in their training program? And this is all inclusive. So it's not an apprentice program. This is a overall um, whole training program because everyone is included. I don't really believe to just focus on apprentices because then we lose our top performers because they're not getting fed. And so this is how do we feed everyone in our company with a, a career development plan? And so um, it takes you through a 12 week training live. So each week we meet for two hours and we really focus on vision. We focus on culture. We focus on brand building. Um, and then how does all of that relate to building your team? So it's really important for you to understand, you know, who you're attracting and why you're attracting them because not all of us are attracting the exact same people. We have different cultures, we have different environment. And so how does that culture show up in your training program? And so, and then it goes through the nuts and the bolts of, the, of training so that you can get your training to be consistent and that your training works without you, the owner. And so there is a, a leadership and a mindset component in each area to help the leader than to think differently about their program. Mm. So that, that comes out um, in another week. And then um, I have another program called, it used to be called Mindset to Mastery, um, but actually now it's called Six Steps to Six Figures. And it's a stylist um, approach to learning how to be a six-figure hairdresser behind the chair. And the beginning part or half of that program is dedicated to goal setting, goal achieving, and understanding numbers and really understanding your business of what you're doing. And then it's technical. So there's core haircutting um, and core foundation in that program as well. 
Love that so much. What's the best way to get a hold of you, Christine? The best way to get hold from, I'll give you my uh, website, which is christinezelinski.com. Mm-hmm. They can get a hold of me there. And or um, on my social channels, which is Christine Zelinsky. Perfect. I love that. And uh, thank you so much for being on this. And, you know, what is one last thing that you believe that every salon owner or leader needs to do to go to go the next level? I would say the number one thing is grow yourself, because at the end of the day, when you think differently, you do differently. Mm -hmm. And I I just love, uh, you know, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at will change by Wayne Dyer. And I just really believe that, you know, it, it happened for me. And I think if it happened for me, it could happen to, for anyone. <laughs> so, <laughs> and both of us too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. We love you. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank both. you so much. Take Bye. care. Bye.